Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning to everyone. And uh, first of all, let me thank all the scientific committee of the MDS Foundation for this kind invitation. My job today is to discuss uh, whether ESA is uh, still the first line reference treatment for anemia in low risk MDS population. And my answer will be no. So I would start with a very simple uh, clinical statement. We know that uh, anemia, and in particular uh, severe transfusion dependent anemia, is the most relevant clinical feature for low risk MDS. And uh, it is associated with uh, a substantial loss of both uh, quality of life uh, and life expectancy uh, with respect to the general population. And the negative effect of anemia in low risk MDS population is uh, strictly related to the degree of severity of this phenomenon. So this means that from a therapeutical point of view, the most relevant point in order to provide a clinical benefit in low risk MDS population is uh, to improve uh, hemoglobin level. So we know that historically, ESA were uh, the reference first light treatment for anemia in low risk MDS population. But uh, as you can see here, we know very well that uh, uh, not a negligible proportion of the patient, almost 40% of the cases, fail to respond to ESA. And there is another uh, uh, proportion of patients, around 30% of the cases, that uh, relapse within one year of the treatment. And we know that uh, until recently, very few uh, therapeutic options were available for treating uh, transfusion-dependent anemia after ESA failure. And as a consequence, uh, most of the patient continued to receive uh, transfusion only for, uh, during the natural history of the disease. So there is uh, an urgent need to identify more effective treatment options to improve anemia in this patient population. So recently, Luspatercept was uh, found to uh, improve in effective erythropoiesis in MDS. And uh, as you can see here, Luspatercept is uh, a first-in-class erythroid maturation agent that neutralizes TGF-beta superfamily ligands, thus providing uh, uh, an enhanced maturation of late-stage erythropoiesis in MDS model. And uh, shifting to the clinic, uh, to MDS patient population, after the results of the randomized medalis trial in most countries, uh, Luspatercept uh, has been approved uh, as a treatment option for uh, patients with transfusion-dependent anemia affected with MDS with ring sideroblast after ESA failure. But there is a strong rationale to try to move the use of uh, Luspatercept and other innovative drugs to treat anemia in MDS patients to the first line uh, setting in order to try to maximize the clinical benefit uh, uh, in terms of treatment of anemia. And the first rationale for moving to the first line treatment with Luspatercept uh, is provided by a biological study that was conducted by Mario Cazzola several years ago. And uh, basically, if you model the contribution of ineffective erythropoiesis to anemia, during the natural history of MDS with ring sideroblast by studying the iron turnover in uh, erythroid uh, bone marrow progenitors, uh, you can uh, clearly appreciate uh, that the contribution of ineffective erythropoiesis to anemia is maximized uh, in a very early stage uh, of the disease uh, and tends to rapidly decrease uh, during uh, the uh, disease natural history. We have another uh, evidence to move uh, new agents into the first-line treatment of anemia in low-risk MDS that uh, uh, is related to our long-term experience with ESA. And uh, we know very well that uh, low-risk MDS uh, with mild anemia treated with ESA had a significant better response rate and better duration of the response than those patients that are treated after the onset 
of uh, uh, transfusion dependency. So according to this uh, uh, biological and clinical evidence, uh, recently the COMMANDS trial uh, compared the efficacy and safety of Luspatercept versus uh, epoetin alpha in the first line treatment of transfusion dependent anemia in low risk MDS population. And overall, uh, 354 patients were enrolled in this <coughs> trial. The primary point was defined by the achievement of a transfusion independence for at least 12 weeks in the first 24 weeks of the treatment with a concurrent mean hemoglobin increase of at least 1.5 gram per deciliter. With respect to the study population, so the characteristic of patients that were enrolled in the COMMANDS trial are consistent with uh, a real-life MDS population with a median age of 74 years. And uh, I would only underline the fact that in both treatment arms, uh, there was a prevalence of patients affected with MDS with ring sideroblast uh, that account for 72% of the study population in this trial. With respect to the primary point, as you can see here, 59% of the patient uh, receiving Luspatercept achieve a clinical benefit versus 31% of the patient treated with epoetin alpha. And the clinical benefit of Luspatercept was maintained in patients stratified uh, by baseline serum hypo level as well as by the baseline transfusional burden. When stratifying patient uh, by the presence of ring sideroblast and SF3B1 mutations, we can appreciate that uh, in uh, RS positive patient there is a clear superiority of Luspatercept in terms of uh, uh, rate of response versus epoetin alpha, while the clinical benefit uh, of the two treatment arms was comparable in patient uh, with uh, uh, MDS uh, RS negative. So Luspatex was superior uh, to epoetin alpha, also considering uh, all the secondary endpoints of the study, as you can see here. Moving to the molecular landscape of the study population, it was consistent to that reported in literature for a cohort of low-risk MDS patients. Two major points in order to define some possible association between uh, individual genomic profile and the probability to achieve a clinical benefit with uh, either Luspatercept or erythropoietin alpha. And as you can see here, uh, the first concept that was that uh, the baseline mutational burden was significantly associated with the probability to achieve a response in patient treated with the poetin alpha, but not in patient treated with Luspatercept. And uh, uh, most importantly, patient with SF3B1, ZXL1, and TET2 mutations were associated with a favorable clinical benefit with Luspatercept versus a poetin alpha. Then we have to shift to the duration of a response that is the second critical point associated with the concept of a clinical benefit. And as you can see here, the duration of transfusion independence was longer in patient treated with Luspatercept as compared to subject receiving a poetin alpha. And the median duration of transfusion independence was 126 weeks for patient in the Luspatercept arm versus seven, six weeks for patient in the epoetin alpha arm. And again, uh, this clinical benefit was maintained after stratifying patient by endogenous EPO level and by the presence of ring sideroblast. With respect to the safety, that is a major point uh, in order to be able to provide reliable treatment for uh, a population of uh, fragile patients. 
Those pattern set uh, was associated with a very good safety profile that was consistent with the previous experience uh, with this drug in other clinical trials. So to summarize the results of the command study, the command study achieved uh, the primary endpoint, uh, demonstrating for the first time by intention to treat analysis that Luspatercept is superior to ESA in the frontline treatment of transfusion-dependent <coughs> anemia in low-risk MDS population. So Luspatercept provided a clinical benefit regardless uh, uh, of subgroups and uh, regardless uh, uh, baseline mutational burden. And finally, Luspatercept has a manageable and predictable safety profile. So my last slide will be uh, a sort of recommendation in order to try to, uh, let's say, implement such a kind of scientific evidence into a real world clinical scenario. And basically we are facing with uh, two possible clinical situation. The first clinical scenario is uh, represented by MDS with uh, SF3B1 mutation and ring sideroblast. And we are, uh, as uh, also discussed by Mario Cazzola, we are facing with uh, a group of patients uh, with uh, a very homogeneous disease, both in terms of uh, uh, molecular features as well as in terms of uh, uh, clinical course. And uh, there is a strong uh, evidence that uh, in this uh, specific population, Luspatercept is associated with an higher rate of response uh, and longer duration of response with respect to epoietin alpha. And Luspatercept should be considered as a, uh, uh, as a first line option to treat transfusion dependent anemia in this uh, specific population. The other clinical scenario is represented by MDS without ring sideroblast and without SF3B1 mutation that represent the vast majority of low-risk patients in a real-world uh, clinical setting. Mm -hmm. And this population is characterized by a large heterogeneity in terms of both biological features, uh, meaning uh, genes mutations, as well as in terms of uh, clinical features and clinical outcome. In general, uh, considering uh, this population as a whole group, uh, we have evidence that uh, Luspatercept is associated with uh, a comparable rate uh, of response uh, with respect to a poet in alpha, but uh, with a longer duration of a clinical benefit. It is uh, a key point uh, in terms of the treatment goal for low-risk MDS population. But uh, we discussed that we are facing with a very heterogeneous population. So in my opinion, we should uh, add some uh, uh, stratification uh, features uh, in order to be uh, able to provide the right treatment choice uh, at individual patient level. And we know in this context that we have uh, two specific situations in which uh, erythropoietin fail to provide a clinical benefit that are patients with uh, high endogenous hippo level and patients with uh, high baseline transfusional burden. In both these situations, the spatters was found to be superior in terms of both the response rate and the response duration. Outside this clinical setting, I think that the most uh, relevant point in favor to the spatercept as a first line treatment for uh, uh, transfusion dependent anemia is that Luspatercept is associated with a longer duration of a clinical benefit. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Matteo. You can sit. Thank you so much. Uh, I have to admit that you were quite convincing towards the supportive of uh, Luspatercept, but you know, we have a problem. I know at least one top expert who tends to disagree with you. So this is uh, Prof Professor Ari Guanidis uh, from uh, Düsseldorf, and uh, Ari is going to convince us that no, uh, probably ESA should stay, and we talked about conservative as opposed to the modern, so he's more conservative. 
Ari. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you, Matteo, for a very wonderful one-sided talk. <laughs> what a rubbish. I'm going to convince you that this is all rubbish, okay? <laughs> if you don't look at the data like you should look at the data. And I'm going to tell you that I am absolutely not in any conflict of interest, although it fills up fully here, but I'm not in conflict of interest. My problem actually with medicine is that it moves so fast forward that you can't keep up. And really what we do is we rely on overviews, on expert testimonies and things like that. And that actually leads us to believe what people say, but rarely we dig into the data and look whether this is actually really true. So, for instance, if you look at the NCCN clinical practice guideline and you look at myelodysplastic syndromes, this is version 3, 2023. Well, actually, it says that you should use uh, uh, Luspatercept in ring syroblastic patients, but it does not uh, tell you that Luspatercept has also been approved in non-ring syroblastics with, an, with, a, with a higher EPO level. So I, 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 I think it's, it's going to change. What I want you to... What I want you to... Um, what I want to emphasize is that you should go a step back and actually rely to the grand minds of internal medicine. Here is Robert Loop. He's an American physician. He was the editor-in-chief of the Cecil and Loop's textbook of medicine. And what he said is the four basic rules of medicine. And rule number one is if what you're doing is working in your patient, keep doing it. So, have you been using EPO in your patients and has it worked? Okay. So, law number two is if what you're doing doesn't work in your patients, stop doing it. Law number three is if you do not know what to do, don't do anything. And law number four is don't let a surgeon get your patient. <laughs> The next thing I would like, the next thing what I, that I would like to emphasize is, and if you look at the pre-test examination questions, you will find a number of, 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 um, of uh, thoughts that I've put up. And I would like to emphasize Winston Churchill. I only believe in statistics that I doctored myself, <laughs> okay? And that's very important when we look at the uh, commands trial. Because if you look at the commands trial, what you see is the key eligibility criteria was that you had patients who had an endogenous EPO level of less than 500. And all those patients were the red blood cell transfusion dependent. And they were actually uh, uh, randomized to luspatercept or epoetin alpha. Now, what we know from Pierre Fernot's paper a couple of years ago that led to the approval of erythropoietin in the, in the European Union is that EPO does not work very well if you are transfusion dependent. It actually does not work very well if you have an EPO level of 200 to 500. So if you go be beyond 200, it's clear that EPO is not going to do well. If you have a transfusion-dependent patient population, it's well known that it's not going to do well. And we know from Rina sitting here uh, that, that, you know, the cumulative density of RBC transfusion is associated with mortality. So we need to treat our patients preemptively before they become transfusion dependent. So the right trial would actually be, how is EPO actually doing if you are not transfusion dependent? Because that's when we want to use EPO. It's not when kind of the damage has been done and is that bad, and then the EPO level is already high, and then, you know, you start and you say, okay, here I've got, uh, I've got EPO now for you. 
No, that's not the right question. Is the question is, can I prevent the patient from becoming transfusion dependent? Now let's have a look. So Luspatercept was better than uh, EPO in this clinical design setting, okay? We have a transfusion independence, which was uh, improved. We had the hemoglobin uh, increase that was, uh, that was there. But we also so see, as Matteo has shown it, that for ring sideroblastic negative patients, this was actually not true, okay? Actually, EPO was numerically better in ring sideroblastic negative patients, and I want to emphasize, in patients who were transfusion dependent, and in a subset of patients who had an EPO level between 200 and 500, that should actually not respond at all. Look at this. Now, if you look at the number of patients with an EPO level above 200, from 200 to 500, it was substantial. It was 20% of patients had an EPO level between 200 and 500. And in Pierre Fenot's paper, what he says is, people do not respond when they have a, an EPO level of 200 to 500. Add to that that these people were transfusion dependent, wow. Okay, so let's have a look here. So you have a 36% response rate with EPO in patients with uh, EPO levels below 200. And you have a 12% response rate in patients who have an EPO level of 200 to 500. So if you exclude those one-fifth of the patients, if you exclude those, what is that going to do with your response rate, with your overall response rate? It's going to increase, right? It's going to increase. And, sorry, and if you look at the ring seroblastic negative, so if you add to that yet that you have patients with an EPO level of 200 to 500 who do not respond very well, and if you add to that that we are talking about a transfusion-dependent patient population, do you know where that goes in ring cytoplastic negative patients? To the moon! <laughs> okay? So the response rate is going to be dramatic with EPO. And if you look at this here, you have the transfusion uh, burden associated with uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, with the uh, with the response in the in the um, in the uh, commands trial and if you look at the non mutated sf3b1 in the lower part of your of 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 the of the panel you see there's no difference okay there's no difference again add to that that we are talking about a transfusion dependent and add to that that we had talked about uh, patients who all also have 200 to 500 EPO, it might actually increase for EPO even further. Now let's switch to side effects. What are the side effects of EPO? Do you know Tour de France? Yes, you know the Tour de France. <laughs> These people <laughs> consist of 80% water and 20% EPO. <laughs> Hey, they do. Wow. <laughs> do you think they have side effects from EPO? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. <laughs> do you want to see the side effect profile of Luspatercept? Wow. 15% fatigue. Say, hey, Lance, do you want some Luspatercept or some EPO going up to Alpe d'Huez in France <laughs> when you're cycling? He's going to say, no, 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 I'll stick with the EPO, you know? I'll stick with the EPO. I don't want fatigue. I don't want to get off my bike and walk up, you know? Diarrhea? I mean, come on, diarrhea. Peripheral edema? Do you want legs like this? No, thank you. Okay? And then look at what happens with, with EPO. It's actually much better. It's much better. And then if you look at nausea, dyspnea, hypertension, come on, that does not exist with EPO. So if you ask me, is EPO still a first-line treatment in myelodysplastic syndromes, lower risk? Yes, it is. It remains standard of care if the patient has an EPO level of below 200, if the patient is transfusion independent, and granted, Matteo, if the patient does not have ring sideroblasts. Thank you.